Stay in here, you're good. But if you step out that door, you are an Avenger. I'm like, boom, you looking for this? You didn't see that coming? You didn't see that coming? You didn't see that coming. Nobody could live up to Tony. Not even Tony. Tony was my best friend. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your guide to the Disney parks, experiences, movies, and more. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 794. And together, as we have been since 2004, I want to help you not only have the best possible vacation experience when you go to the Disney parks, but I also want to bring you a little bit of Disney, or this week, Marvel, magic, wherever you are, here on the podcast, my weekly live video every Wednesday, events, newsletter, and more. Please join the community and find everything at www.radio.com. So it has been a big, huge Huge week for the Marvel Cinematic Universe and us as fans with the release of Deadpool and Wolverine and more than a few huge surprise announcements from San Diego Comic-Con. So this week, we'll kick things off with a review, spoilers ahead, of the highly anticipated Deadpool and Wolverine and why this film is significant in more ways than one. And then there's a lot to talk and speculate about from Kevin Feige and Marvel Studios, and we'll explore what these announcements from San Diego Comic-Con mean for the future of the MCU and us as fans. Of course, I want to hear from you. What upcoming Marvel Cinematic Universe film are you most excited for? You can share your thoughts in the WW Radio Clubhouse at www.radio.com slash clubhouse, or call the voicemail. I'll play it on the air at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-WW1. Then stay tuned for a Disney trivia question of the week where you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. And after the show is over, the best way to stay connected and not miss a thing is to sign up for my free weekly email newsletter delivered right to your inbox with news, updates, special events, exclusive content and contests and more. And when you do, you'll also get a free copy of my 102 things to do at least once in Walt Disney World book, You can connect with me on social. I am at Lou Mangiello on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And visit LouMangiello.com if you are either looking for a speaker for your conference or event or to your business to talk about lessons that you can learn from the Disney parks on customer service and experience and leadership. Or if you're a creator, entrepreneur, or solopreneur looking to take your idea, business, or brand to the next level, you can find out some of the different ways I can help you and we can work together, as well as about my Momentum Series events, including my workshop this September in Walt Disney World. World. And if you like what you hear, and I hope that you do, please share the show and tell a friend. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. If you are, or in some people's cases were, a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and maybe you needed a little something to relight your nerdy spark, Deadpool and Wolverine might just be what you've been waiting for. Because after a number of box office and small screen, less than resoundingly epic feedback from fans, the MCU needed a win. And I think a big one. And I'm not saying that Marvel was relying on Deadpool to save it, but he doesn't call himself Marvel Jesus for nothing. It has been a big week for Marvel with the release of Deadpool and Wolverine and the San Diego Comic-Con announcements all in just a few days. So this week, we're going to look at both and discuss what each means for the future of the MCU. And like Deadpool said, in Deadpool 2, it's a family film. But don't take the little ones to see it. I took my little one, who's not so little anymore, and he's here with me to talk about the movie, the announcements, and the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You may know my son Nicholas from such shows as many food reviews, unlimited hot cocoa, and Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween Party. So, Nicholas, welcome back. 
I don't think they have hot cocoa at Mickey's Halloween, not scary ha- Halloween party, but that's Christmas okay. party, Halloween. It's they all just sort of blend into each other. There's there's hot chocolate in, in Halloween because usually in Florida it's 112 degrees. Anyway. By the time you get it, it's already melted, so it's like the same thing. So look, man, you have you've literally like I have raised you right. You have grown up on Marvel movies, and you know the Marvel stuff is. Something that we do together, right? We go to comic book stores, we go to comic cons, et, et cetera. And I think you and I are, and and tell me if I'm wrong, but I think sort of after Endgame, which, you know, we saw in the theaters, I, I think I saw it five times. You probably saw it like twice as many. There hasn't been anything necessarily that has blown us away on sort of like an epic level on the big or small screen. You're absolutely right. Ever Endgame was this pivotal moment that they really need to shift and be like, okay, this is the end of this story. What are we going to do with the next? And that just so happened to coincide with the global pandemic that happened. So they kind of had to shift gears a lot and we're trying to figure out what way was the best way to do it. But I, I think it ultimately led to them. They had some great stuff. WandaVision was great. Loki was great. I really enjoyed Wakanda Forever. But some stuff that's come out with, they just, I feel like they lost their path and they were trying to satisfy too many people, put out too many shows, and just led to them blundering a lot of these things that people were really, really excited for. Yeah, you know, and look, after Endgame, you know, look, I'm a huge Spider-Man fan, so Far From Home came out. But And you're right, I think the pandemic, without a doubt, affected a lot. Black Widow, I think, was a victim, specifically because of of the, I don't think it's a bad movie, but I think timing-wise... I think because what had happened to Black Widow, spoiler alert, in the, the earlier movies, it, it was out of place being released in 2021. Um, Shang-Chi, I know, got a lot of, you know, great critical response. I, I thought it was fine. Eternals did not necessarily hit, like, across the board. Listen, give Eternals credit where it's due. It had some of the best effects that we've seen on the MCU, but the story was a little lacking. Like I, I've tried to watch Eternals multiple times after, and like even in the background, it's just not, and you know, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, I, I thought was okay. Thor: Love and Thunder did, certainly did not perform well. Um, I'm, Quantum Mania, I don't think needs to be you know even <laughs> spoken about, and I, I was not a huge fan of the Marvels for a variety of reasons. Disney Plus, same thing. I think WandaVision was groundbreaking. We'll call it TV because that's where you watch on the TV. But the things that followed after, I, I loved the first season of Loki. I loved Moon Knight. Um, I, I liked seeing Daredevil and She-Hulk. But, you know, I didn't, I, I was not a huge fan of the Hawkeye series or even the second season of Loki. Um, and and same things like with, with Echo. So, you know, I, I, couldn't believe that we were sort of jokingly, half jokingly, saying that Deadpool needed to save Marvel, and he kind of did. Yeah, after all of that was happening, people were kind of needing some sort of a breath of fresh air for both the multiverse concept that had been done in these movies again and again and again, and also just in the Marvel world because, like, there was just nothing going on, and people, it was very like, especially after Jonathan Majors and everything that happened, that it was a very uncertain future for the MCU. So everyone was kind of like, where are we going to go with this? So they kind of needed this really big win with Deadpool and Wolverine in order to like reignite people's fire for Marvel. I agree with you a thousand percent. And and look, it's, it's also a risky move because Deadpool, for a variety of reasons, is not for everybody, right? It is not for the whole family. You know, you sort of, everybody has to parent differently and decide when is the appropriate age to start letting your kids see Deadpool? I, you know, maybe I start you a little bit too early, but it's fine. You'll be fine. A little bit of therapy, you'll be good. Um, but I also think, Nick, that there was a little bit of nervousness going into Deadpool because of, I think, because of the stakes, right? I think because there was so much relying on it. And I don't just mean from a Marvel business financial return perspective, but I think in terms of fandom, whether you are a relatively new fan of the cinematic universe or are a longtime comic book fan, there was a little bit of nervousness because, not because of the Deadpool movies that have preceded it, but because of the other movies that had preceded it. So did you have that too? Did you sort of have that like 
nervous anticipation going into Deadpool? Absolutely. When going into Deadpool, I knew that they really had to deliver. And like, it obviously made me like, after all the previous things they're coming out with, I was cautiously optimistic going into it because I was like, okay, it's Deadpool, it's Ryan Reynolds, like, he knows how to make a good movie, but also, like, it's the MCU, so some of the past stuff has been a little... Uh, so, I was cautiously optimistic going into it. I think some people were... had a, a similar bit of nervousness, not just because, one, it's the third movie, right? As, as movies go on, sometimes they say you never can re- replace or repeat the success of the original. There also was, you know... I'm making this up as I go. It's like the Mickey Mouse factor, right? Once Disney acquired the rights to Deadpool, there was the, well, how much is Disney going to, or or does Disney have to almost sanitize the character a little bit because he is now under the Disney umbrella? And first of the many spoiler alerts, like they did not pull back at all. And I think... And I applaud everybody across the board. I think that it very much goes to the Ryan Reynolds vision and dedication to the character having to be like the comic book character. But if you were concerned that Deadpool Disney was going to have to pull any punches and pull any jokes other than one, then that does not happen at all. Yeah, they do not hold back at all in the movie. Like, from the blood to the gore to the language to they also just poke fun at itself. Like they really gave them a lot of creative freedom to create the best Deadpool movie, which I think is the only way they could have done it. If they brought Deadpool back as a PG 13 character, it would, there would have been outrage riots in the street. (laughs) There would be, there would be, and you would lose the trust of fans. And I think this, I think from a 30,000 foot view, like this was very much, more than just about Deadpool. This was about either regaining the trust or keeping the trust of Disney fans. And yes, because it's Deadpool, there has to be a certain level. And I think it, this was actually probably the most goriest and and bloody of, you know, in terms of the, the violence factor. Language is not pulled back. And you're right. One of the things that I loved about this movie, and, and I applaud everybody sort of on the Disney and, and the Marvel side is, it very much is self-aware and makes a lot of very clear fun of itself and the company that, that is tongue in cheek, but is, is very much on point. And I think we, I think we as fans appreciate that, right? Instead of just sort of ignoring certain things, the fact that you're self-aware of it, you put it all out there, you break the fourth wall, I think is one of the things that's endearing about the character, about Ryan Reynolds. It also goes to the fact that Disney knows what people are saying. They know that people were upset with the multiverse, like, and they poke, it pokes fun at itself. They poke fun at everything that's happened in the MCU before, say, like, even one of the lines was just, like, him, Deadpool, saying that you're coming into the MCU at kind of a low point, like, he's right, this is, like, the low, like, this is, fan morale hasn't really been too high for a while, so just the fact that it was self-aware shows that they're listening and that they know what they need to do. And I think they know what the fans want, right? It, it, this movie hit for me because it was fun. It was funny. It had great n- nostalgic appeal because I think it integrates so many past and present elements of the MCU. There is a lot of fan service, not just for recent Marvel or Deadpool fans, but for longtime fans of not just the movies and the characters, but the comics as well. I, I think this is very much a an intentional love letter to diehard MCU and comic book fans. And look, I, I want to go back just because I want I want to like go back just to watch for Easter eggs, right? We watch the movie the first time to take the overall movie in for itself. Then sometimes we go back again for for certain moments to see things that we missed for performances. I want to go back and just try and pick up the countless number of Easter eggs that are in there that we as fans watched the movie and were like, they did this for me, right? This is totally just for us. And that's one of the things that that I really, really love and appreciate about it. And you can tell that a fan made this movie. Like Ryan Reynolds is a fan who made this movie. It's absolutely a fan's film. Like there are some things in this movie that so many people just like would go into the movie and be like, 
why is Channing Tatum this guy with these cards? Like <laughs> something like that. Like and the fact that they just made him like a more integral part of the movie than most people would think. Like that and just everything things in the background. Like every like every single little Fox universe character like they had like as a little villain in the secret lair of cassandra like just little things like that show that like they put a lot of care and love into making this movie what it is so that the fi- the fans themselves really appreciate yeah. it and i i just uh, i debated like up until the time i hit record like is this a spoiler free i think we, in, in, i think we have to sort of make this a spoiler review in order to talk about some things because it those are the elements that I think make this movie, right? There's there's a scene I want to just go back to. It's like it's like the portal scene in Endgame. I want to go back and just wa- watch this scene over and over again because there's so much to it. So here is your spoiler warning or reminder once again. We we will and we have to sort of get into plot points and, and characters and Easter eggs and some of the things that will spoil it for you if you have not seen it before. But before, like... There's so much that I loved about this movie, but I, I, you know, I, Disney and Marvel, they are storytelling companies and it is all about stories. Let's just sort of talk very quickly about what the overall plot is without going into too much detail. It involves Deadpool being pulled into a new mission by the TVA, the Time Variance Authority, which you know from Loki, teaming up with Wolverine to face a, a significant threat, which ties very deeply into the overall MCU multiverse uh, storyline and timeline. But the thing I want to talk about first is the the actors and the characters themselves. I want to talk about the performances that we saw in the film, primarily by the, you know, by, by Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman, by the way, who is like, he's Wolverine and he's the greatest showman. You want to talk about somebody who has massive, massive range in terms of acting chops. Like, I don't, is he the Wolverine who also sings and dances or is he the greatest showman who's also like one of the baddest, most jacked Marvel characters ever? And what I love is that from the very first film, and I mean the Deadpool films, I don't mean that Wade Wilson that we saw that we shall not talk about in a prior X-Men film, but the characters are so true to the comics and there is this remarkable chemistry that... Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman, Deadpool, Wolverine have with each uh, with each other through a, a variety of scenes that are both humorous. Actually, they're, they're humorous or they're action oriented or they're dramatic. Like, there are some very emotional moments in this film, uh, especially for Deadpool. And it's for some people, I think it it's. I've heard people say, well, it's it's sort of odd because you have these emotional moments that sort of disrupt the pacing. But I think that you need to sort of set the stage as to what, you know, what is the why? Why is Deadpool doing what he is doing, right? He wants to matter, right? He wants to find his place in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And, you know, there's a, there's a wonderfully, like, beautiful and emotional, it's not very long, but the speech from Deadpool that when he calls himself the luckiest man in the world, like... That's a nice piece of acting chops from Ryan Reynolds. I absolutely agree. They definitely, a lot of actors flex their acting, acting muscles, but that's also like, they also just show the chemistry that they have with each other that goes beyond just acting. Like Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman are like have this chemistry that like you just like feel throughout the entire film. You can tell that they're friends and they're having fun. Like, and just every scene that they have together, you just are like locked into your chair because you're so invested and it's just, they have great chemistry. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think it comes through on screen because you almost get the sense that Ryan Reynolds is Deadpool in real life. Like this is just the way he is all the time. I I also think that like I think everybody could be friends with Ryan Reynolds. Like he just seems to have that personality that makes him so likable. Whether he's you know Deadpool, whether he's in a a, a rom com, or you know I want to buy Mint Mobile just because <laughs> it's Ryan Reynolds. Um, but and I think for for Hugh Jackman. Um, and you know, as as Deadpool is sort of searching for Wolverine across these different timelines, I loved how Hugh Jackman played so many different iterations of Wolverine. 
including the comic accurate, like very short Wolverine that we see. But there were subtle, you know, there's subtle differences in the very short scenes that Hugh Jackman had playing these different variants of the Wolverine character. He, every single scene was different with him. There was him with the, like, in the apocalyptic, like, fire land. There was him laying on the cross <laughs> above the sea of skulls. Which is right out of a comic yeah. book cover, yeah. There was old man, like, just, it shows a little bit of, like, he's slight differences in each of them, but it shows how many different Wolverines are out there. But I definitely think the shortest one was the best one. Yeah. <laughs> Because right. in real life, in real life, in comic book life, Wolverine is like 5'3". Yeah. So technically I'm taller than Wolverine, but Hugh Jackman is like 6'3". But that's one of those fan service moments. Like we know that Hugh Jackman is not the right size. So when he's in that scene and you see little Wolverine, like you could just hear like this like outroar of laughter in the theater. But I think, you know, when I was describing like what the the plot is, for the film and, and how it is this mix of action and humor. And I think very heartfelt moments um, that, that I think we've gotten along the way in, in the different Deadpool movies, right? I think Deadpool, like he has emotional depth as a character. He's just not the guy who's, you know, the Merc with a mouth, but Deadpool and Wolverine really is a redemption story for both characters who are not only trying to find purpose, but I think, value even though they have such troubled and difficult pasts the movie starts out with him getting rejected from the avengers and then just being like my life is over i'm gonna work as a car dealer like <laughs> for the rest of my life so it really like and the wolverine we meet in this movie is the one that is supposedly the quote-unquote worst wolverine who let down his world and got everyone killed and started killing after the x-men died like it's it really really right it's a redemption story for both of them in their own unique ways deadpool trying to find his purpose after that rejection and then it just ended up like having his life crumble a little bit so he's looking for his purpose and then wolverine's trying to find something beyond just what happened to him and what will define him yeah and we know wolverine in this uh, sorry deadpool in the second movie joked about it being a family you know his motivation is family based, right? He's not out for revenge. He's not out for money. He's not out for fame. He's doing it because there's these nine people in this photograph that he has, the characters from the past two movies, not just Vanessa, that he truly loves and just wants to be with and accepted by. And I think when you watch some of the early trailers, you're like, well, wait, you know, I see Deadpool and Wolverine fighting each other, and, and they do. A lot, <laughs> which, you know, and there's there are some epic fight scenes in this uh, between the two of them that happen more than once. But it's also, you know, every there has to be an antagonist and protagonist or or multiples of two. Let's talk about the villains of the, the two f of, of the films, which are characters that I think aren't necessarily the most well known. Right. It, it, it's not a Thanos. It's not somebody on that level and i think when some people saw the original trailer they're like oh it must be a variant of professor x well close but not really so cassandra nova is sort of the main villain of a certain section of the film and she has a let's what i won't spoil too much but she has a real there is she is related to professor x in some very complicated form or fashion and there's also sort of a secondary villain who is from and works at the TVA. His name is Mr. Paradox, and he's played by Matthew McFadden. And talk to me, Nick, about the the villains. because it, And it's interesting because there have been, over the years, sometimes Marvel movies that don't necessarily do well, they talk about the villain problem. Well, there, there's, there's not a compelling villain. You can even look at some of the more recent films. Uh, Modoc, I'm looking at, I'm looking away, but I'm looking at you. Talk to me about your thoughts about Cassandra Nova and Mr. Paradox in terms of the villains of, you know, the opposite side of the coin in this film. Yeah, I think for this film, I think they make good antagonists because I think Mr. Paradox is there mostly for jokes. Like even in the beginning, you can tell that he like bring Matthew McFadden's performance is very much a like joke oriented just the way he he's very like electric i'd like to say because he's always every line he delivers is like we need to stop the tva and you're the best like he just 
I don't know. He brings this charm to him that's really fun. And then Cassandra Nova is on the other side where she brings this almost intimidating feel that helps create more of a threat to the story. So I think both of them complement each other in ways that they both have what each other are missing, where Matthew McFadden's really comedic and Cassandra Nova is more serious. And I think they make great villains for this movie. Yeah, it was interesting because the villains some can sometimes are are larger than life. And I think here they're very much not. And as you watch the film, and again, I think this is a film you almost have to go because there's so much happening all at once, both visually and just in terms of, of storyline. Trying to understand, you know, Cassandra Nova's uh, motivations and, and the clarity, I think, of which, and are they are they compelling, right? It's, look, you look at it at a villain like Thanos, it is very clear what his motivations are and why. And if you're going to start to sort of break the character down, is that the same there? Mr. Paradox, I, I was sort of, he's not necessarily on screen a ton of time, but I was wondering just how impactful what he was doing and what his intentions were. Was he sort of the puppet master in terms of a lot of what was going on? Again, I don't want to sort of spoil, you know, how the movie ends and, and go into too much detail, but I sort of wondered, are these going to be one hit wonder characters that we never see or hear from again, or is there going to be this longer lasting impact because of them and because of their motivations, because of the things that they are doing, not just the way that Deadpool and Wolverine respond. I think that this score, this story, and especially it's made by the villains, but it's also very self-contained. Like I feel that the, all the stories, including the villain stories are wrapped up in a nice little neat bow at the end. So I don't believe that's going to be the like main impact that the story that this story has, but I do think it will have an impact. Right. I think like some other movies, they are you can watch Ant-Man is a is a great example, right? You can sort of watch it and it it exists on its own, but things that happen in the movie will trickle out. You know, this is not going to be the last time we see Deadpool. Um <laughs> as for Wolverine, <laughs> he keeps joking about, you know, they're going to make him do it till he's 90. Maybe Maybe they might. I don't think anybody would complain if we, if we, but the way that they brought Logan back uh, and, and Wolverine back, like just made sense. Like I was okay with, because I think for me, and I know for, for some other fans, the multiverse and the variants, it gets very, very complicated. And there's, I think to a certain degree, there's less gravitas because, well, now you can sort of write anything away nothing matters anymore because it's a variant because it's it's a multiverse because there's a way to bring it back but i think the way that they did it here like it worked for me and i was okay with it there was a moment in the film that i was like are they going to destroy the tva and just the multiverse completely but i think you're so far down that path that you just can't it was the only way they could really bring it other than like I, like, I don't even know. There was no other way other than the TVA to both bring Deadpool into the MCU and bring back the Wolverine and some of the characters that you see. It was a good, like, as much as I'm not a huge fan of some of the multiverse stuff, it was a good way to bring all these characters together in a way that fits the MCU, like, canon. It's not about just bringing the characters or Deadpool into the MCU. Nicholas... Something happened because of this movie that I never, ever could have imagined or I would have always bet against. When Deadpool showed up in Disneyland <laughs> the day after the movie debuted as Deadpool, I'm like, well, he's obviously can't speak. Oh, no, he speaks and he jokes and he is Deadpool and Wolverine is there, too. And story time with Deadpool. I cannot wait to go see it. And I'm, I'm trying not to watch a lot of the videos because I want to see it in person. but. Who would have ever imagined that you would see a walk around talking Deadpool character telling, again, these very self-aware, um, very self-mocking jokes in a Disney park? Um, you know, it almost seems like he's going off script, but he's not. And I love the fact that they allow him the range to not just make fun of himself, but to make fun of Disney, to make fun of you know, princesses, whatever it might be, in, in a fun way, not in a in a mean spirited kind of way. If you would have told me that Deadpool was going to be in the Disney parks after watching Deadpool one, I've been like, 
this character, there's no way you're crazy, but they integrate him in a way that's both family friendly, like they need him to be, while also not losing the Deadpool charm that I'm really excited to go see it. Yeah. Like, I'm really, really interested to see more because I haven't really watched anything but from what I have seen. They did a really, really great job at bringing him. Right. And parks. you are perfectly safe bringing your five-year-old child to go see Deadpool and Disney California Adventure, you are not perfectly safe to bring that. Now you have now you as a parent have a tough time saying, well, you can see him in the parks, but you can't see the movie just yet. Um, but I, I do love, but I, that that's it, Nick. It goes back to what we said at the very beginning. This is such, and not in like an icky, um, pandering kind of way, but it's such a, fa- it's such a, a fan service film in terms of, the story in terms of the jokes in terms of the countless cameos but i think it has such a a respect for marvel history and emotional storytelling which is why i think and the farther i got away from it and and sort of to process it more and think about it more it did it's it's respectful in terms of marvel comic book and marvel cinematic universe history but it also does have a, an emotional side to it. It's not just joke, 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 because after a while, you know, if, if you get that repetitively, it, it you almost become come sort of uh, immune or sort of numb to it. So you have these sort of little emotional arcs and roller coasters in there, but it really is this, this love letter that I think we as fans wanted and needed and appreciate it. it but that's what it is. It's a love letter to us. Absolutely. Like, as I said before, there are things in this movie that only the most diehard of diehard fans will get. And I think that really goes so that they really want to appeal to the true fans, the people who read their comics, who do their research, who know all the stories and backstories about some of these movies that have come out or not come out. And it's just, it shows how the dedication to making these mo- like movies for the fans. Well, and it goes to two of my favorite aspects of the film itself which are Easter eggs and cameos, 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 which supposedly Ryan Reynolds handpicked these cameos and the actors for not just comedic impact, but I think to reward MCU fans. And not just MCU fans, but I think fans of the Fox era of the movie. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about, cameos first and there are a lot some of them are more subtle than others and some of them in especially in that one scene where they sort of come together when they're in the void i I, that's the scene i want to watch over and over and over again because we always expect there to be a, a cameo here and there and i love how they were able to continue the tradition of inserting stan lee in there not obviously in a, in a speaking way but stan lee once again is in uh paid tribute to in the film, but talk to me about the wildly, if you would have told me that these characters would have been in there and let's sort of talk about the the main ones that we're, that we're referring to. Um, and, and there's, there's, there's a few minor ones, right? Like seeing Henry Cavill as Cavalry and Cavalry, you know, like Henry Cavill, who, you know, famously played Superman in, in the, the DC universe was great, but seeing Wesley Snipes as Blade, if you ever would have told me that Elektra would have been, that Jennifer Garner's Elektra, who, if you've never seen the original Daredevil film um, uh, and and then the follow, where she was in and then the follow-up standalone film, Elektra, one, you're not missing very much. And two, if you would have told me that that character would have been inserted into a film ever again, I would have, uh, it made no sense, but it was a huge, like, fan reaction. Absolutely. Some of these characters, like, they never really got an ending. They never really got, like, anything after their original movie because some of these movies were just not well received. So it was really, really great to see some of them back. Like, never in a million years did I think Wesley Snipes would be back <laughs> as Blade. Like, when he walked out, I was like, there's no way. And I think even more as a shocker was Channing Tatum walking out as Gambit because there's just such a storied history behind him in that role. And to see him actually play that role, even if it was for just that cameo experience, like 
appearance was amazing. And these characters too are self-aware. Like Wesley Snipes talks about how he's the only blade and you get that sort of subtle look at the camera from Ryan Reynolds, because obviously the, the Marisha Ali blade is, it's been in development for a long time, but it's coming. Uh, in electric. like 2035. It, but it'll, Listen, I would rather have them do it right than rush it out and it be done incorrectly. Because I love, first of all, I loved the, I love Wesley Snipes as Blade. I love the original, tril- the Blade trilogy, where we first saw Ryan Reynolds in Blade 3, basically portraying a character that was just Deadpool without the mask. I mean, he, I think Ryan, I mean, Ryan Reynolds is just the same character in every movie, but he sort of was, the wisecracking Merc with a mouth um, anti-establishment guy in Blade 3. And they famously didn't get along in that movie. Um, Wesley Snipes Wesley Snipes is a very method actor. And Ryan Reynolds even talks about it. He's like, I never met Wesley Snipes. I only met Blade while the filming of the... So they were able to, you know, bury their hatchet. Um, Cause he even made, there's a, there's a, quick throwaway joke about him not like he says i don't like you (laughs) and which is clearly just a callback to the fact that they did not like each other so that's what i mean in terms of these super super deep cuts Uh, jennifer garter makes a um a reference so she was at one time married to ben affleck who played daredevil um when oh deadpool talks about daredevil being dead she sort of has to sort of throw away like i really don't care like sort of response to it which breaks the fourth and the fifth wall because of the personal and that like those are the super deep cuts that maybe not everybody's going to get but if you know you know and you're like yeah they threw this in there for me like i get exactly what you're trying to do here another example of that is just like the entire script for gambit was him talking about how he never truly had a home he was never loved he never had a mommy he never had a daddy and he just never had a chance to shine which is like that was his story like for years and years and years he was trying to get gambit in one of the x-men movies trying to get a gambit movie made and then just it never ended up happening so it was right, like so to, just to sort of be clear so for years uh going back to like 2008, nine, maybe somewhere around there, like rumors of Gambit being in a movie, which he eventually was, but played by a different actor. And then a Gambit standalone movie where Channing Tatum was cast. He loves the character. He's from New Orleans, like all these things. And there was just, you know, year after year, it was, okay, Gambit's being greenlit, Gambit's in development, Gambit's getting pulled back. So he was supposed to be Gambit but never got to play the role. So seeing him in the Gambit costume and again, poking fun at the character himself and the fact that that standalone movie never got made. Like I was just sitting there with a smile. I found myself, Nicholas, not only literally laughing out loud during this movie, but just having a smile on like this wonderfully warm and satisfied smile on my face as we saw these cameos, as we saw the the different Wolverine variants and like, oh, I get that. And, you know, even like seeing Happy Hogan at the beginning and, and you're trying to pay attention to the movie, but you're also looking at all the Avengers memorabilia in the background. And you want to talk about a total curveball. Yes, you see this little glimpse of Thor, but then when you see Chris Evans, you're like, Cap is back, baby. And <laughs> the complete curveball where he comes back as Johnny Storm, again, from the Fox version of an early Fantastic Four film that maybe did not perform as expected. Like, that's the sort of, like, gift to Marvel fans. Absolutely. Seeing Johnny Storm, like, even if it was for a very brief moment, like, was just such a cool, like, fan moment for everybody. Because everyone... Everyone expected cameos, but no one expected some of them to go that deep. They were like, oh, they're going to bring back X-Men characters, like maybe some of these people who didn't have too many lines or just little people. But seeing Chris Evans back in the MCU as a completely <laughs> different character was so, so cool to see. And even like the the variants of, we talk about, you know, there's the variants of Wolverine, uh, but the variants of the Deadpool, right? The Deadpool core and seeing Lady Deadpool and the the... Headpool, all of whom, some of whom were were voiced like Nathan Fillion was Headpool, and did you not know that? 
No. <laughs> so Nathan, Nathan Fillion, like, you know, for years has these like tiny, tiny little cameos. Matthew McConaughey was one of those. So they bring in- Blake Lively was Lady Deadpool. Blake, and that was sort of like, was it going to be Blake Lively or was it going to be Mrs. Kelsey? I was just hoping it was going to be Ryan Reynolds in a wig, let's be honest. <laughs> But that's and look, even you know when Ryan Reynolds is in the car and he's in the taxi, he's sort of doing the little thwips like Spider Man. Like those are sort of all the the cool different and and like you said, the the variations of um of of Logan, you know the 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 short Wolverine, the Apocalypse Wolverine, the Patch Wolverine, um, and Wolverine fighting Hulk as as well. Um, and I loved seeing some of the X Men characters like Sabretooth and Pyro. And Toad, like Ray Park reprising his role as Toad. And, and I think we love seeing Tyler Maine reprising his role as Sabretooth from the original X-Men film and not the Leif Schreiber version of Sabretooth. So all those things, that the little details in the background, again, I wanted to go watch the scene in the void to see all the little Easter eggs and comic book covers and things like that that are, are very deliberately placed there as tiny little presents for us to pick up. All right, so I, I want to talk about some of the other things we, you know, that happened at Comic Con this week. So, in in wrapping up our look at Deadpool and Wolverine and sort of its overall impact on the MCU, I, I think it is this wonderfully refreshing, very fun addition that I think reminds us why we love these movies, why we love superhu, why we love superhero movies to begin with, and it's it is this shot in the arm not of adamantium, but of adrenaline for the MCU. Like this is Ryan Reynolds wild ride, right? I think him convincing Disney to let him continue to make his movie, which it needed to be to laugh at itself, to laugh at Disney. I haven't laughed out loud in a movie in a long time from a moral perspective. It's the first movie that I want to go back to see, not on the small screen, but I want to see in theaters again, the chemistry, the 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 double edged the double edged sword about the chemistry between Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman and Deadpool and Wolverine is that this is probably going to be the last time we see it. But I think you know you you add this chemistry to legendary film buddies like Goose and Maverick, Timon and Pumbaa, Bill and Ted, Harold and Kamar, Napoleon Dynamite and Pedro. Ferris and Cameron, Jake and Elwood, Marty and Doc, and Murtaugh and Riggs. I absolutely loved it um, and can't wait to go see it again. Your thoughts in terms of looking at the film itself and then the overall impact on the cinematic universe? I mean, you put it in a great way. Like, I absolutely loved everything about this film and especially what it did for the MCU. The impact it brings not only is significant canonically, but also just like, like, for fan reception and for fan like reinvigorating people for the MCU is exactly what the MCU needed to get people interested with these fan moments that like l- cause the theater to jump up and scream like oh my god oh my like you that's the first time you saw it without me which is fine I'll, I won't hold against you for too many years there were literally like fans like you said I mean that's not an exaggeration there were fans jumping up and running up and down the aisle screaming there was one crazy lady in my theater who was running up and down running talking about dog pool which listen I'm so happy that you found your character (laughs) Mary Puppins Mary Puppins her number one fan was in my theater and she was running up and down the aisle at the end and look this is not just us or a few other uber nerds talking about how much we love this movie like this enjoyed a remarkable record shattering opening weekend 480 some odd million dollars worldwide for the biggest domestic and global open for an r-rated movie not a superhero movie of all uh, sorry 438 million of all time right that thing that includes 205 million domestically and i think what and this is a, maybe a great way to sort of transition is Marvel realizes that one of the best ways to continue on its journey of success and maybe revive some of, of the success that it's had in the past is with a strategy of nostalgia, right? Bringing back key figures from the past here, but also leveraging that sense of nostalgia going forward. That brings us to San Diego Comic-Con where 
Marvel president Kevin Feige was in all Hall H again to talk about some of the upcoming projects that I think very much are looking to the next phases of the future, but still sort of like Walt, keep one foot in the past. So let's just sort of quickly go through some of the announcements, some of the surprises, any sort of additional details we got. And we'll go chronologically film by film. And I know, Nicholas, we say every year that we're going to go to Sandy. We go to New York Comic Con every year. I, I know it's chaotic, but one of these years we have to just, we have to get into Hall Next H. year, we got to make it happen. It. Call your, call some buddies at Comic Con, <laughs> call some buddies somewhere. Let's get out there and let's just make it happen. All right. So let's go again. Let's go chronologically by release date. And next is going to be Captain America Brave New World, which comes out February 14th, 2025. Here, Anthony Mackie stars as the new Captain America, which is uh, Sam Wilson. It also features uh, a, a, a new Falcon. Harrison Ford is joining the MCU as pres President Thaddeus Ross. And we also finally know who the wonderful Giancarlo Esposito is going to play. He's a character sidewinder who you might not be familiar with, but if you are a comic book fan, you know him as the King of the Serpent Society. And if you remember to a number of uh, Comic-Cons years ago, one of the proposed titles for a Captain America film was going to be Captain America, the Serpent Society. So it all comes full circle but he is a um, he is a a strong character with teleportation skills and all these other skills and and um, curious to see what this film is going to be not just for him but you know Harrison Ford he's Indiana Jones he's Han Solo he's now the president again not necessarily on Air Force One this time but he's also going to be and and they got to see a clip of Harrison Ford as Red Hulk transforming right outside the White House. Yeah, I think that I'm personally someone who enjoyed um, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, so I'm really, really excited about this film. And it's going to bring us back to that ground level, like less multiversal, focusing more on like and more isolated story, which I'm really, really excited for. And I think, I don't know, John Carl Esposito, I don't know if we're going to be seeing teleporting, teleporting around based on the trailers, but you never know. Yeah, and you hit on something that is very much in line with me. I am a ground level superhero fan. I always have been, right? As as a kid, Spider Man has always been my favorite. Daredevil, especially as I got older, I, I sort of relate a lot more and understand a lot more the the character of Daredevil. But they exist on and sort of above, in Spidey's case, on the street. So I am not as if, personal preference. I am not as fond of the galaxy-based multiversal time variant stories as much as I am as the things that happen on Earth on the ground. And I think that you're right. I think this is what, I, I don't think I'm alone. I think Captain America is a beloved character. Um, even seeing a new person holding the mantle or holding the shield as the case may be and bringing those stories back down um, to the ground. And just another quick added point, just a little story detail that I found really interesting that they mentioned is that we're finally going to see what happened with the celestial body that's been sitting in the middle of the Indian Ocean for the past three years that's supposedly sticking out of the Earth. Right, just been ignored by everybody else. And it's yeah. finally going to be the origin of adamantium in the MCU. That's what I was, yeah, was going to say. Like, there's the connective tissue that automatically sort of brings this and connects us to so many other stories. For those who don't know, adamantium is... It's the metal that is in Wolverine's body. It's just hyper powerful metal, similar to vibranium, and it's going to be great to finally see it. Its introduction, and how, I'm very curious about how it's going to be used in the MCU. And one of the things I, I love about the release date, so this releases on Valentine's Day, so there may be some unhappy girlfriends, boyfriends, spouses that are going to be happy Valentine's Day. Instead of the romantic dinner, I'm taking to a romantic movie and we're going to go see Captain America Brave New World and, and I probably will be screaming at the screen instead of, you know, paying attention to you. But the next release, you know, it, it's been a long time in between theatrical releases. Again, the, the idea is that they were going to sort of pull back. Feige's like, oh, we're going to pull back. We're going to do less, better. 
But Thunderbolts, the next release, comes out on May 2nd. So the amount of time that we have to wait in between films, I think films that obviously will, will have some sort of connection between them, is much, much shorter and ex ex exactly what we as fans need. Thunderbolts is going to bring back and bring together a number of characters that we have seen in the past disconnected in film. So Wyatt Russell, who was John Walker from Falcon Winter Soldier, is going to come back. And you want to talk, and, I, and this is a testament to Wyatt Russell's acting chops. He was a character that was so disliked on screen and very, very violent. But he's coming back saying people are going to love his character. Sebastian Stan is coming back as Bucky, Bucky Barnes. Maybe or maybe not for the last time. He sort of hinted to having nine lives and not really sure how many are left. Ghost from Ant-Man and the Wasp is going to come back with a new suit. And I love, and I know she's not, I love Julie Louis-Dreyfus as Valentina Allegra de Fontaine. Um, she's coming back. And if you, and I, I haven't seen the trailer because it was only released there, but read some of the reviews from people who were in Hall H. She's seen in this trailer standing in front of Avengers Tower or what may be Valentina Tower. Yeah, there are a lot of things that I've heard about this panel and just about this movie that I'm very interested to see. One of the things that has like I've been thinking about for a while is the asterisks that they've insisted is part of the title. Like even in some of the like official material, you can see that there's an asterisk in the Thunderbolt in the Thunderbolts title, which makes me think, is it gonna be a mislead? Are they gonna change the title at the end of the movie? It's something that I think is so smart because it's going to keep you wondering about, okay, why is that little thing there? And I was talking to my friends and I have to give them credit because this is not my original idea, but I think it's going to be potentially a title change to the Dark Avengers. Whoa. Nice. Look at you, nerd. Oh, my sweet little baby nerdy boy. <laughs> because it is, it, the, the Thunderbolts are this sort of ragtag group of anti-heroes. So we didn't, the other person we didn't talk about because I wanted to sort of save for the last was David Harbour as Red Guardian who came out at Comic-Con in the full Red Guardian suit, like in character and then looks up at the stage. He's like, wait a minute, I, am I the only one here in costume? Uh, you also would know David Harbour famously from Stranger Things, but it is, it is this sort of group of misfits that's being almost forcibly pulled or pushed together to go on what is probably going to be some some unique and unconventional missions that are going to eventually tie them to the larger MCU storyline leading into the Avengers films. We got a little brief synopsis from the panel where there's a new character that they introduced that we do not know the name yet, played by Lewis Pullman, who only labeled himself as Bob. And... <laughs> All of the Thunderbolts, each of the individual characters, are given an individual job to protect him, which causes them all to eventually join forces on this unusual, like, mission that they have, which causes them to get into antics and sue. <laughs> I love it. It's like Peter from X-Force. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that comes out in May of 2025. And I love that because I think Thunderbolts, Nick, again, unless you're a hardcore comic book fan you've never heard that name before and you don't know you know what when the mcu started we were all somewhat familiar we knew who iron man we know captain america but you hear some of these secondary and tertiary characters now coming together to get their own film i don't think this is going to be the last time we see something like this young avengers i'm, I'm looking at you or west coast avengers i'm also looking at you so having them come together again in not just a film that is going to exist in, in its own space, but something that's going to tie into the rest of the MCU, which takes its next step again, just a few months. Like it is going to be the summer of Marvel in 2025 because in July, Fantastic Four, which has just been renamed Fantastic Four First Steps releases. This one, I think, Nick, is Fantastic Four who really sort of, you know, birthed Marvel and and you know, going back to the origins of the comics, 
this is one that fans have been waiting for for years. You're like, well, wait a minute. There, there were Fantastic Four films. It was actually not one, but two tries at it many years ago, none of which really sort of took. I think the first one was, was fun. It was a little campy. The second one, we got to see Silver Surfer, and then there was this reboot that- Fan-fortastic. Not, fan-fortastic. That did not go well, but it has been- and, and the casting of this from the very beginning- was interesting because we saw a a um, Reed Richards in Doctor Strange, and we're like, oh, now we know who the casting is going to be, and this is the person everyone wanted, John Krasinski, and it's not. So the cast here includes Pedro Pascal as Reed Richards. Talk about Pedro Pascal riding a huge high. Vanessa Kirby as Sue Storm, Joseph Quinn as Johnny Storm, and Eben Moss background as. Ben Grimm. It is a, it's interesting, I think, choices in terms of casting, but there are people way smarter than me that know that this is probably the right mix. And I think there's there's a couple of really interesting things about this film. One, this does take place in a retro future alternate universe of the 1960s. So think moon landing, Era. We got to look at the Fantastic Car, which is the, the Fantastic Four vehicle inspired by that retro 60s sci-fi theme. It's very Jetsons looking. But there's a couple of things that I think are really interesting. One, Michael Giacchino is composing, and I l- absolutely love Michael Giacchino's work, not just from Up, but more importantly from things like Lost. But some of the other details that we got was Reed Richard, uh, sorry, the uh, Reed Richards is going to be a science teacher. The thing is going to appear on a dating show. And we know that in some form or fashion, this is going to involve space travel, which allows them to bring in not one, but two villains. We are going to see Silver Surfer again, but this is going to be the introduction finally of Galactus, who we sort of had a hint was coming. And from what I understand from the trailer, was seen very quickly at sort of the um, the the little finale of the trailer that they were let go in the leak trailer that i did not watch because <laughs> no one was recording there they show a lot of really really great things that really ex- like this is probably my most anticipated mcu movie to wow. come out because like it's gonna be so unique and in, the best way i can describe the world that they are in is whimsical this kind of 1960s vision of the future with like very unique architecture and everything and it just, I'm, I'm like floored for words. I'm so so excited. And just another thing, oh my God, his name, Evan Moss Bakra as the thing is my favorite casting that they've done for the MCU in so, so long. Why? So explain I, why the connection. What have, what else have you seen him in? He has been. He was Richie in the Bear for anyone who watched <laughs> it, and he's just such a well. Like, he's such a great actor, and I think the way he portrays that character shows how well he will portray the thing you in love this movie. The bear. Oh my you goodness, love the bear. The bear so like, <laughs> everybody, get on the bear right now. You gotta go see it. Also, not necessarily family friendly for language, but a great story, and, and he's phenomenal. In, in So I agree with you. We talked about sort of this, the retro future vibe that is very sort of WandaVision esque, and like WandaVision, this is going to be shot in four four to three aspect ratio. So sort of old square TV aspect ratio, which is reminiscent of the first, I think it was two or three episodes of WandaVision. So they are all in on this retro future vibe and look and feel of it. So I think this is the one that is, it almost appears like it's going to be an outlier because it's it's thematically and time-wise sort of separated but we also know, <clears throat> excuse me, that it's going to connect because it's going to introduce the Fantastic Four and set up their future involvement in the MCU leading into the not one, but two Avengers movies. Yeah, and I think that the only way they could have done this movie is if they really played into that 60s charm, shooting it in four by three aspect ratio, mm-hmm. having like a little bit of grain, just like the whole aesthetic, everything. They either need to go all in or not right. do it at all because that's what's going to make this movie. And it's, again, it goes to, like, we as fans, we love that commitment to it, right? It's one of the things I loved about WandaVision, like, which I think is some of the best Disney Plus 
stuff that Marvel has ever put out. I don't think I don't think we've seen anything like WandaVision since WandaVision in terms of really going all in on it. And and it's part of what I love. Um, nothing else really happened at Comic Con, right? There was no other. Nope. Good night, guys. <laughs> so, so, all right. So we. Uh, so next is is are the Avengers and Avengers Five, which now is retitled. Before we talk about the film and the casting, I think it's very important to mention that the Russo brothers, who previously directed four of the major MCU films, including Endgame, which grossed just under $3 billion, are returning. Nicholas, I think this is incredibly important and critical, especially for these films, because we talked about Endgame. Endgame. We haven't had anything like Endgame. I think in addition to the casting of characters and scripts and all that, you need the Russo brothers to create another Endgame, which what is now going to be called Avengers Doomsday and Avengers Secret Wars. Yeah, the Do- the Russo brothers definitely know how to create epicness on a scale that we like no other movies can compare to. Like all four of their movies and their MCU filmography are absolutely like some of the best of the best, including but not limited to Captain America Winter Soldier, Civil War, and then Infinity War and Endgame. They always bring this level of scale and like these moments that every single person in that theater will just light up for. So I think it was the best possible choice to bring them back for these movies. Sometimes you need to go backwards in order to go forward. Sometimes you need to look to people in your past in order to take the next step. Avengers Doomsday, which releases May 1st, October 2026, marks a number of very important things, including a shift from the next big, bad, epic villain going from Kang, remember, this was supposed to be the Kang Dynasty films, to Doctor Doom. Nicholas, I don't like to take credit, but however, I'm usually, I'm not always, I'm rarely right about when I make predictions, but two weeks ago, when I was expecting this for D23, I made a prediction for what was going to happen in the studio's presentation, and I said, Dr. Doom. The looks and responses I get were one of, that would be nice, but Mangello, you're crazy, yet here we are, shifting from Kang to Dr. Doom, obviously following the Jonathan Major's legal issues that, that necessitated him having to move on. First of all, making the shift from away from Kang as a character, I think was not only smart, it was the right thing to do. And from a fan perspective, I did not love Kang. I didn't love Kang the character. I did not love Jonathan Major's portrayal. I, I really did not like Jonathan Major's portrayal of him in Loki season two, especially as like Mr. Timely. I just, there was something that did not resonate with me and I was fearful I'm like, I can't see him being the next big, bad supervillain that is going to have to sort of carry the next two, three, four or more films. So sometimes, you know, it takes something unfortunate to lead to a good result. And before we even talk about the actors, just the shift from Kang to Dr. Doom, who is an amazing, complicated, incredible character. I I think back and it's on my shelf in here i still have um, a marvel trade paperback book called bring on the bad guys that i read countless times as a kid maybe once or twice as an adult and it's where i sort of fell in love with the character of dr doom who transcends not just a single storyline with you know fantastic four or spider-man but he crosses over to so many characters like he just makes so much more sense yeah, it was definitely interesting to see the shift. Like, I was very interested to see the direction they were going to take after the whole Jonathan, Jonathan Majors debacle because they were all in on Kang. They had mm-hmm. said from the start, Kang is the new big bad. And they set him up all the way back in Loki season one, which I actually enjoyed the performance that he gave because he was trying to play so many characters at once with all the variants, even the ones that showed up at the end of Quantumania. But I also wasn't entirely sold on the Kang idea because they just nothing ever came of it after those two appearances. So I don't think Quantumania helped anybody. Either. Yeah, no, I think Quantumania definitely like 
put them in the right direction towards a shift. But I think Jonathan Majors and his whole debacle definitely sent it over the edge. But I think this was, you're absolutely right. It was the perfect shift that they needed to make. And Doctor Doom was going to be the perfect character to be this, like, big bad. Yeah, Doctor Doom is, is, and the Doctor Doom that we're going to see is not the Doctor Doom that you saw in some of the earlier iterations of the Fantastic Four films um, where he did not come nearly like live up to who that character is. His, he has an, I mean, we won't go too deep into it here, but an incredible backstory that is rooted in, you know, magic and powers. And yeah, I, I think this, I think this is going to be a huge, huge, but Nick, who do you cast? Like who could possibly take over like the, the role that is so critical who could wear the mask and be dr doom different masks same task it has to be <laughs> robert downey jr you want to talk about something that nobody on planet earth in any variant or universe saw coming was the return of robert downey jr to the mcu but returning not as iron man but a different type of Iron Man, but returning as Doctor Doom, that moment where there was silence as he walks out on stage with the mask and then he takes the mask off. And there's still that like second. If you watch, there's like a second. Everyone needs to sort of process what they just saw. And then the room collectively loses its marbles. Yeah, like in no world or like universe would I have ever expected it. But like- the thing about it is they didn't even just say, oh, he's going to be playing Dr. Doom. They say Robert Downey Jr. is Victor Von Doom. Right. He is not Tony Stark in Dr. Doom's clothes. He is Victor Von Doom, which I don't know how they're going to do it or the, the way they're going to do it. But it's going to go in one of two directions. They're going to they're gonna knock it out of the ballpark or they're going to fumble it. I mean, there are... And again, comic books are not necessarily linear either, right? There are often different runs of comics that have different types of storylines that get characters. There are two different comic storylines where Tony Stark and Dr. Doom slash Victor Von Doom do sort of cross over, interact with each other in different ways. Will they draw from those comic storylines or will they come up with their own unique way? Do they address the fact that, wow, this guy looks a lot like Tony Stark or is it just going to be, look, we wanted to find the best actor for this role. And yes, he just happens to play. Look, Kevin Feige and the folks there, they obviously know what their plan is. I'm curious to see how he execute on, executes on it because it is going to involve those multiverse, multiversal elements and draw inspiration from Jonathan Hickman's Secret Wars storyline, which features Dr. Doom as a central character that rules over the entire multiverse, which is why a year later we get Avengers Secret Wars, which follows directly. Like it is like a sequel to Avengers Doomsday and it's going to conclude the multiverse saga. So now we know we sort of have not just the timeline, but we have sort of an end date to where this very complicated, convoluted, sometimes confusing multiverse will have it's end date and end game, but this is what, Nick, I think a lot of fans, especially who have been fans of, of the Secret War run of comics, is looking forward to because there is this massive, monumental crossover of characters from the MCU that draws from this Secret Wars storyline where all of these different sort of multiversal incursions lead to a battle on the aptly named Battle World, which is overseen by Doctor Doom. Yeah, Secret Wars has the insurmountable task, also the burden of collecting and figuring out what to do with everything that's happened in every single multiversal thing that's happened in the MCU. Like, over these past few years, we've seen... Oh, variant A in universe 369 got a sandwich yesterday and all these different things happen. And it, that movie has the task of bringing everything together and 
I'm so excited to see, but I'm also very nervous because I don't know how they're going to do that because of how much they have to cover and how much they have to combine into one movie. There's a lot of characters. There's a lot of variants of characters. There's a lot of different storylines that all have to sort of converge at the central time and place for this, you know, literally the battle to end all battles um, in, in terms of the the superhero storylines. I'm smiling as I'm saying this because I'm trying to envision what this is going to look like on screen. And if you remember, if you remember, because we still feel this way, right? If I'm, if, ever, if I'm ever having a bad day, Nicholas, this is true. If I'm ever having like a bad, and I just need something to sort of pick me up and sushi is not readily available, I will go on Disney Plus on my computer and I will scrub, I'll pull up a movie and I will scrub to near the very end when Captain America grabs Mjolnir and becomes worthy and then everyone comes out of the portals and there's this, the most epic. Remember the first time we saw that and like just, there were like tears in my eyes and like smile. But imagine that on a scale that is exponentially bigger with dozens, hundreds of additional characters and variants of these characters how they're going to pull it off, I don't know, but I can't wait to see what the result is going to be. Yeah, like, they are going to have to bring all this home and tie it up in one neat bow, but I think that it's going to be with the Russo brothers, it's going to be with a collective of everyone who's worked on everything. I think that they are going to hopefully knock it out of the ballpark. Because think, think back to Civil War, when we saw the two factions of our favorite superheroes running at each other to fight. Like you couldn't sort of imagine these people who are supposed to be on the same team fighting each other. It's that magnified to, you know, not just global, but but universal and, and multiversal proportions. Like if they go the battle world route, the way that the comics do, like we're just going to see an all out battle royale of every <laughs> single character we've seen over the past few years. That'll hopefully culminate in a union of, everything into one more understandable and confined like timeline. Yeah. I um I, I'm you know, we've got a few years to wait and there's a lot of exciting things to happen between now and then, but it's nice to sort of have that North Star to sort of look at, knowing that everything that's going to happen between now and then is building to and for and towards Avengers Secret Wars. And then we figure out where we go from there. Um, there were a few, I, I'm not going to call them omissions because they were omitted intentionally, but there were some things that were noticeably absent from the presentation, which I think, and I'm hoping are being saved for D23, the ultimate Disney fan event in just, yikes, a week, <laughs> a little more than a week. Um, we know about Blade. I think we're going to get some updates and I hopefully want to see something from Blade, which has faced some creative challenges um, uh, along with its release date. But I think we're going to see a lot in terms of the Disney Plus shows uh, like Agatha All Along, uh, Ironheart. Um, and the thing that, you know, I am most excited for is Charlie Cox returning as Matt Murdock and Vincent D'Onofrio as Kingpin uh, for Daredevil Born Again, which is going to premiere on Disney Plus in spring 2025. I've said it countless times. I will say it again. I think the Netflix version of Daredevil was some of, if not still, the best overall content that Marvel on the big or small screen has ever put out. It is, again, it is dark and gritty and violent and not for kids, but it is an incredible character, which which I love. And I, uh, look, he is a lawyer um, who, like, I'm not blind, but I really, <laughs> like, so many, and, he, and he's Catholic, like, so many things that I personally relate to, but the performances from those two actors is absolutely outstanding. And again, it's those ground level characters in very familiar that the New York setting, um, you know, which just sort of happens to overlap with, with my other favorite character, which is Spider-Man. Uh, so I think that we'll see hopefully not just um, Charlie Cox and Vince D'Onofrio on stage again, but we'll see our first clip from Daredevil board again. And that'll be the place to show it. Cause like, D23 is the place to show the Disney Plus shows. So I think they were saving all of that for D23. And hopefully you guys get to see some of the clips or even more extended trailers that they showed at Comic-Con.
Yeah. And I'd love to see something from Blade. I like, yeah. I'd really, I'd really like to see something. That movie's been going th- through it for a while. So it would be good to finally like get some peace of mind and be like, okay, the movie's still happening, still going to go out, and it's going to be great. I think the only thing that's remained consistent is Marshall Ali as Blade. Like the creative yeah. team has been sort of recycled and they lost directors, writers, like different, multiple different scripts that have gone over and over and over. Like, Blade needs to win right now. Yeah. Well, it, look, it means that it obviously did not even come close to meeting the standards that it needed to, but better that you start all, like, just scrap it and start all over again than release something that is not going to, because again, this is not about satisfying fans anymore. Our expectation is we need to be wowed. We need to be overwhelmed. We need to have our expectations exceeded. So that's what Blade needs to do. And and I applaud them for being aware enough to realize that early on in the process. I'd rather them take another five years and come out right. with a bad movie. Like, take as long as you need, get the script right, get the right writers, get the right directors, get everyone in order, and then come out with hopefully what will be the best Blade movie. Because it's not going to be, I think we expect it to not be a single standalone Blade movie. Blade, you know, we talk about sort of team-ups, and they're already sort of laying the foundation for things like the Midnight Suns or something like that that could be coming later on. So you have to get the character right from the outset or else Midnight Suns and some of those other team-ups and and uh, interactions with other characters that we're seeing being introduced on Disney Plus um, and on the big screen can't happen if, it, if the movie fails right out of the gate. Um, okay, so there was, we covered a lot. We covered a lot. What, and I think you answered this already. Like, so the, the project you're most excited for is Fantastic Four? Fantastic Four, and also see how they just make Doctor Doom work. Like, that's the thing I'm most curious about, but Fantastic Four is the thing I'm most excited about, I think. What was the most surprising announcement for you? I mean, it's Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> like, nobody would have ever, because there have been fan castings for years and years. years. Is who's going to be our Doctor Doom? Who's going to be, like... People thought like Killian Murphy, Killian Murphy. People thought even like John Carlos Esposito, like all these different actors that were going to be put in this super titular role. And for the, to see them go back to someone that they already had, like some people were like, obviously very excited, but some people were always like, were like, what, what about our cat? What about casting someone new? What about someone new in the role? So they really need to knock this out of the ballpark to justify going back to Robert Downey Jr. Because to bring someone back like that who had such a big sacrifice in the MCU <laughs> is very ballsy. Like, right. and it's going to be interesting. That's all. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, that's that's what I'm saying. We have to sort of trust that they know what they're doing because there's a lot of people that are curious or criticizing or, you know, don't like this. They're like, oh, Rob, Artie Day should only be... Uh, they must know that there's a reason for them making that kind of a very sort of wildly interesting choice um, in, in terms of of the casting of what is going to be the most important character introduction uh, in a long, long time. I said at the beginning, Nicholas, that Daredevil, uh, Daredevil, <laughs> you can see where my mind is, Deadpool and Wolverine and the announcements at San Diego Comic-Con come at a time where we as Marvel fans, we as MCU fans needed more than just a win. We needed more than something. We needed something that needed to be like incredibly impactful and either make us excited for what's coming, make us fall back in love. Having all this now in context of what the last week just gave us, how do you as someone who has grown up with these characters, with these stories, and in the MCU, how does all this make you feel going forward? Going forward, I think I'm still cautiously optimistic, but I think it's a promising future. Like, I think what they showed at Comic-Con, especially, like, helped renew hope in some of the movies, specifically Captain America Brave New World, because that went through its own production problems with scripts and reshoots and, like, a lot of things behind the scenes. So it was good to finally see that movie and hear more about that movie and see it get to a good place. Even the Thunderbolts was up in the air. Just a lot of things that people were very curious about. So I think it looks, a lot of the stuff they showed looks very, very promising. 
Yeah, I think it's an interesting time because we're getting to the end of stories with these characters and actors that we have known and loved and been part of our lives for such a long time, right? Going back to the original Iron Man. And it's scary when you have to introduce new characters, new actors, and hopes that people will fall in love with them too. So this is a turning of the page that I think is happening at just the right time, right? I think it, I think we need to turn the page from these characters and stories that we have known and been familiar with for so long to start anew, introduce us to characters that maybe we aren't familiar with, maybe unless you're a hardcore Marvel or, or comic book fan, and start this next generation, next chapter, next um, phase, whatever you want to call it, of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, both on the big screen and then what is to come in on Disney Plus as well. Whatever it is, man, it is a still a great time to be a Marvel fan. I I love the fact that this is hopefully bringing more people into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, making them go back, start to watch some of the films. I loved seeing on, on social people saying, oh, I'm excited for this. What do I need to go back and watch, right? Oh, Deadpool and Wolverine, what movies do I need to go and watch to sort of catch up with the Wolverine story? What do I need to watch in anticipation of these new movies that are coming out? And it introduces people and hopefully kids and families and things that people can do like we have done for so long together, right? And that's, the, you know, maybe not Deadpool, but for parents and kids and, and friends and husbands and wives and everybody, being able to do this kind of stuff together and enjoy these together because there's nothing like sitting in that theater like we did two days ago with me just hitting you on the shoulder as characters are coming out and Easter eggs are, are being there because that is what this is all. Deadpool's right. It is all about family and, you know, family doesn't have to necessarily be blood, but the family, family is an F word. Yeah, so that we get to experience together. Uh, dude, this was awesome. This was fun. I have I'd like this incredibly renewed excitement for what's, it's coming up and like let's just go to a comic book store man like because um, i'm psyched let's just go break into comic-con and grab the clips <laughs> we'll now now we're, now i just want to see i want to see the yeah see the clips i really i'm really curious to see what everyone saw in that hall h panel yeah it goes back to right it's you know as this was we used to sort of gather around the computer gather on the laptop to sort of watch these clips come out I, rem together. I remember like so long ago when they were announcing so many of these movies and I was like seeing the posts come out like <laughs> as the panels were happening. I was like, oh my God, there's another, oh my God, there's just another, oh my God. Like, and it's really, it was, it's really great to have that feeling back. Yeah. And I, look, I am very fortunate to be able to not only be exhibiting at D23 um, in August 8th, 9th and 10th, but I'm going to be uh, present at the Honda Center for not just the Legends panel, not just Parks and Resorts, but really what is going to be coming out of the studios and especially looking forward to what's coming from Marvel. I am going to be sharing it live as it happens on social, so stay tuned to uh, most likely probably my Instagram stories at Lou Mangello and come be part of the community and conversation. I would love to hear from you your thoughts about Deadpool and Wolverine, as well as the announcements from San Diego Comic-Con and what you are expecting, hoping for, and what our reactions are going to be to what comes out at D23. It's still going to be Expo to me. Nicholas Mangello, this was awesome. Like, I'm going to give you a hug as soon as we're done recording, man, because this is what it is all about. Um, I appreciate, and as time has gone on, man, you've become so much more insightful and thoughtful and our conversations have sort of just grown and matured about these things i love being able to still do this stuff with you i'm getting choked up i'm just happy to sit here and yap about marvel for <laughs> an hour and a half all right so it's hitting me more on an emotional level than you but that's fine dude you're awesome yeah number one thing that you're looking forward to go mm. disney plus you already asked that you already asked this question uh, no number one thing on disney plus you're looking forward to oh uh time for our Disney, or in this week's case, Marvel Trivia Question of the Week, where you can test your knowledge and enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. And this week's trivia contest is once again brought to you by you, because by joining the WW Radio Nation, you help bring every episode of the show to life. And for as little as a dollar per month, you can unlock exclusive rewards like scavenger hunts, trivia quests, 
monthly group video calls, private community access, and a surprise care packages delivered right to your door. Plus, your contribution helps our Dream Team project, which sends children with life-threatening illnesses to Walt Disney World through Make-A-Wish. And on a personal level, I am just so incredibly grateful to and for you and the love, support, and friendship and help you give me and the show. And I love being able to give back to you each and every month. I want to thank some new and longtime members of the Nation family, including Isabella Lewis, Katie Cope, Justin Yo, Janelle Garrison, Jim Webb, and Michael Kell. And to find out how you can become a member of the Nation and help the show, you can visit www.radio.com slash support. Now, before we get to this week's question, let's go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week we went back to the parks and back in time because your question was to tell me what was the name of the first ever 3D film shown at Walt Disney World. Thanks to everyone who entered, got this one correct, and remembered that the film was Magic Journeys. And this premiered on opening day, October 1st, 1982, at Epcot Imagination Pavilion, and then later moved to Magic Kingdom's Fantasyland Theater in 1986. Now, you may not remember this 16-minute film that was directed by Murray Lerner, but what you might not know or remember is that the soundtrack, which was very whimsical, was created by the Sherman Brothers and explored a child's imagination through these very surreal 3D visuals of everyday life, like running through the park with kites and playgrounds, etc., it was a little weird. Anyway, it was eventually replaced by Captain EO in 1986 and then The Legend of the Lion King in Magic Kingdom when it closed in December 1983. Anyway, I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one, and last week you were playing for a WW Radio 3D keychain, stickers, pin, and mystery items. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is... Philip Mazur. So, Philip, congratulations. I will get your prize package out to you right away. And if it played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Marvel Cinematic Universe Trivia Challenge. So while I could easily do a show about the top 100 reasons we love Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige, it takes a massive team to bring these MCU films to life. And the first film, Iron Man in 2008, was a huge risk for Marvel for a number of reasons, another show for another day. But who did Marvel choose to direct the film that would launch the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Who directed the original Iron Man in 2008? You have until Sunday, August 4th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern to go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, use the form there. Again, this week, you're going to play for the keychain, the pin, the stickers, and maybe some Marvel-related mystery items. So good luck and have fun. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in this week, whether it is your first time listening to the show or if you've been together with us since 2005. I sincerely appreciate you. Just remember, just because it's the end of the episode, it doesn't mean it is the end of the fun. Come please join the community and conversation over in the clubhouse on Facebook. Please be sure to follow me on social, especially next week as I'll be covering D23, the ultimate Disney fan event. It's still Expo to me. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, August 9th, 10th, and 11th, I'll be sharing things as they happen, probably live on my Instagram stories. That's where I'll be doing sort of real-time, as it happens, reporting on what is being announced and what is happening. I'll also share them to the WW Radio page on Facebook stories as well. And if you can't get there but want to sort of just chat with others about what is going on, I'll also have a live booth cam in the WW Radio and Mouse Fan Travel booth where you can have a bird's eye view of what is happening, just not just in the booth, but on the show floor. More importantly, a place to gather and chat with other Disney fans and friends. And that will be both on our Facebook page as well as on YouTube. And remember, the best way to keep updated on what is going on, not just for WW Radio and live shows and events, but other updates as well, is to subscribe to our free weekly email newsletter. There's no algorithm, nothing to check. It is delivered to your inbox every Wednesday. You can just go to www.radio.com slash subscribe. Thanks as always to our travel provider and sponsor, Mouse Fan Travel. Whether you're coming to one of our events or anywhere that you want to go, they have been my recommended and trusted partner for more than 17 years. They handle the planning so you can focus on the memories. More importantly, they offer free vacation planning services. So visit mousefantravel.com for a fee-free, no obligation quote today. Again, thank you so very much for spending and sharing your time with me. 
If you like this week's show, please help spread the word, share the show, and tell a friend. If there's ever anything I can do for you or to help you in any way, visit lumangelo.com. Reach out to me there. And please always remember, now more than ever, to choose the good, be the good, and spread a ripple effect of positivity to others. Have a great day and even better tomorrow. So until next time, I love and appreciate you. See ya. Hi, Lou. It's Samantha from Pittsburgh. Um, I was a little behind in my listening, and I just listened to the episode about the top 10 iconic sounds in Walt Disney World, and I loved it. Um, many of them brought a smile to my face, but the one that I want to add, because it did not get covered, is the sound of the chimes on the Skyliner that come, like, right before they make an announcement, and we, for me, my first family trip with my children was shortly after the Skyliner opened, and we've always stayed at Skyliner Resorts, and we just, that sound is like our welcome to Disney sound. Like, we get on the Skyliner, and we're either going somewhere for dinner or to one of the parks, and it's just like, like, you get that sound and the rush of the cool air as the Skyliner takes off, and it's just like, you know, it's comfort and welcome home, and it's it's awesome. So, definitely putting that Skyliner chime sound onto your list. Thanks so much for everything, Lou, and I look forward to hearing more. Hey, Lou, it's Patrice Roberti from Metro Boston. I just got a beautiful package in the mail, a really cool mailer, too. I have this uh, deep blue mailer and opened it up. And well, you are very imaginative. It came perfectly. Big Thunder Mining Co. in its fancy schmancy packaging. And the stock certificate is beautiful. And uh, just your letter is beautiful. And the idea is very, 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 very creative. It's com- Completely. If I'm coming up on two years since I discovered your show, I'm very grateful. It's been a good two years of listening for sure, and, and going back practically 20 years from all the other ones I've heard. And I'm just really glad I found you. You're so positive, and well, people must tell you this all the time. But you're so positive in a world with so many things that aren't positive or, for various reasons. And it's just such a nice show. It is. My honor, my pleasure to support your show. It feels like, uh, I always feel like I'm getting much more of the value of it. And I don't mean the gifts, uh, just the listening and the ideas and, uh, looking things up. And I looked up Aunt Polly's in yesterday because I was listening to a program with you and Ryan, uh, Ryan, Ryan, you know, Ryan Wilson. I think I got that right. Um, talking about that and I didn't know what it was like. So it's just, um, it's very, I think I said this the other day, very entertaining, so nice. It's impossible to believe that you, I mean, you must have stayed in your house all the time when you were young because you're a very friendly fellow and you're good at it and, and you seem very pleasant and friendly. It's impossible to believe you didn't have a million friends. So I'm glad you have a million now. Thank you for this beautiful gift. I will show it to my husband later. And, uh, and again, all best wishes for you. Coming up, coming up, D23. I can't wait to hear what you guys say about it. Take care. Bye. Hey, Lou, this is Jeff from uh, Bucks County, PA. Uh, you know, we've met a couple of times at Marathon Weekend. I'm usually the one that runs by you. It's uh, Morton Foster. Um, as for the comment, I haven't listened to your show for a while. It's been not for any reason other than I just don't spend much time in the car anymore. I spent about a year and a half ago. I became a full-time stay-at-home dad, so I'm not driving, which is when I do most of my podcast listening. But uh, I just checked out your two most recent episodes, the one on um, restaurants outside of Walt Disney World and then the one um, – uh, about the sounds of Walt Disney World. And uh, the first one, the restaurants, I totally relate to your story about your dad when you said that your dad wanted to go off property. Because I remember when I was about seven years old, back in 1983, and I was with my family, and we left property. I remember thinking, like, what, like, what, what are we doing? Like, what, what, why? You know what I mean? Like, what, what's the reason? But uh, my dad, like you were saying, like your father, was, like, loved to eat. He loved talking about restaurants. And um, unfortunately, my dad is still with us, but um, he's, much like you, he, you know, instilled this love of all things Disney and, and to myself and my siblings, uh, which I'm, you know, completely grateful for. Uh, the other comment I want to make is about the show about the sounds. Uh, you mentioned the thing about the, the, the slamming minor outdoors, the old school minor outdoors that they used to cast members to slam shut. When I first saw the title of the podcast episode, that was one of the first things that the first thing that came on was the, the steamboat whistle. The, the minor outdoors are the second, and I distinctly remember that when I was a child. Now, I don't know when they stopped doing that, like when they became the automated ones, but man, I can totally picture them walking down the platform and just slamming the two doors shut. So that's kind of a, a neat old memory. I was glad you mentioned it because, like I said, it was one of the first things I thought of. So, uh, but anyway, I was, I was, it was great to hear your show again. I'm definitely going to go back and start listening. All the shows I miss because I, I don't, you know, it's, it's great to hear it. Uh, anyhow, if you don't hear from me, I will see you, definitely see you in January, Marathon Weekend. Take care of you.